Awesome, thank you. So I think we probably have our group. Um, I wanted to, to kick us off and uh, share a little bit of the survey results and also the research that um, the CPO office did uh, to, to try to both develop the survey and also um, to you know inform this group's conversation. So I wanna start with the attempt to gather research on other states um, so that there was uh, some examples this group had to, to look at. Thanks, Doris. Um, welcome, everyone, and thank you for participating in the survey. Um, just wanted to kind of level set with the research that's been done or we attempted to do for uh, temporary placements. Um, Brian and I spent a lot of time trying to find in other states a program or a system that really mimicked what this group has been discussing. And I'll be really honest, we, we really struggled to find that in isolation. So. Um, you know, the survey results, which I know Doris will go through, there was a lot of things mentioned on, on what it could look like, what it could be mimicking in Colorado. I know there's nothing in Colorado right now that this group has identified as being that fit for what's envisioned, but we also didn't really find that in other states as well, um, which is great because we can build it from scratch here, which is awesome. Um, I did just want to share the reshare, I guess, the research that got closest to the mark with this group. And that was when we were looking at special investigative staff, some of those entities had temporary placements or temporary considerations in their programs in terms of um, when they would go out and look. It, again, I really wanna emphasize this does not mimic what this group has talked about, but it might be a starting place for some of those discussions. And that was this piece that we sent out, excuse me, in November. Um, and so this kind of looked at that Texas program. Uh, we've had the Texas Special Investigator Unit come in, so I'm also going to share some of that research. It's, again, not exactly where we want to be, but I think it might help just get you started. And then I'll also reshare Vermont um, and the Texas Special Program as well. So I'm sorry we couldn't find more. Um, if anyone has any suggestions where we can take it, we're always happy to, to look, but we just couldn't find something that really mimicked what we thought this group was was trying to get to. And just forgive the multitude of links I'm throwing in here, but just for convenience, so you don't have to look Doris, have I missed anything? No, what is the second link that you popped in? So the second one that I just put in is the Texas program. Which oh, specifically on Texas. So the, the the first one was the different responses when when youth run away from care. And then the second one is specific to Texas. Yeah. And the third uh, one is okay. specific to Vermont. Again, they're not exactly what we've talked about and they're kind of buried in there. Um, but if you're looking for little nuggets just to refresh your memory, I think those would be the best place to start. With. Gotcha. Any questions on the research I can answer or suggestions? Anything anyone here feels like we missed? It's okay, you're not gonna hurt our feelings, really. It would help us solve the puzzle because we looked, I promise. Um, okay. Yeah, we did have a couple of folks in their survey response, um, you know, with, with the question on, you know, anything that should be included in a policy or protocol for a temporary placement indicate not sure. Um, as well as things that should be avoided. And so, you know, I, I thought maybe refreshing folks' memory on some of the research that was provided before might be helpful in, you know, potentially coming up with some, to your, using your language, nuggets of ideas. And then just for fun, in case it helps, here's the, um, let me give you one more. This is kind of that information sharing and immediate law enforcement contact, just because I feel like it might be in there as well. Is there anything else I can provide anyone? Doris, anything else I can help with? Uh, not that is top of mind for me. 
Um, I want to check and see if anything is top of mind for others in the group. Um, I'm actually going to, because we have, um, I think, a, a decent amount of time together and we have a smaller group. Um, I'm going to allow some time for folks to just actually refresh their memory on the content that Jordan reshared. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to walk through the survey results first. Um, I put together a, a short slide deck just so that you can see what other folks um, noted in the survey. Um, and then, you know, sort of recap the questions that are going to be part of our discussion and then give you some time to review the, you know, kind of what you saw in other states um, and jot down, you know, just take some quick notes on the things that stood out to you that you think would be helpful. And then we'll have some discussion. Dennis, I see your hand raised. Yeah, I, I accidentally filled out the wrong survey, so. Oh, gotcha, okay. Which is fine because I'm really concerned about the direction that other group is moving, I think. So, gotcha, okay, yeah, so, you so you really filled out the survey you wanted to fill out. No, no I, this is the group I wanna be in. I'm just concerned about the direction of the other group. Yeah, got it. I was teasing you, Dennis. Dennis, I can send you a link to the survey if you want to pop in really quick and just make a record there. Yeah, okay. let's, that would be good. Thanks. Let me, awesome. Yeah. If you I just put it in the chat, chat, I can. Yeah. yeah, it's a pretty short survey, so it should be it should be pretty easy. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, well, let me do another quick check. Any questions, Janelle? Sorry, it took me forever to figure out how to raise the hand. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> I don't feel well, you guys. I'm sorry. Um, no problem. We're glad that you joined despite not feeling well. Uh, I just got hit by a bus, I think. Um, I Did I fill out the right survey? Now I'm questioning myself. I'll go look. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Dennis got me all you worried. Too. It was about restraint. You didn't do the right survey. It's okay. I can let everyone know. I didn't do the right survey either. No, no it's about restraint. So the good news is that the link is in here now. We can all go do the correct survey. Oh my gosh. I'm we so had sorry. seven, we had seven respondents. Let's see. Janelle, you filled it out. Norma filled it out. Beth, oh. you got it. Anna got it. Elizabeth, you got it. Kelly Abbott and Brian Cotter. So if I didn't okay, clear so I did. Okay. Yeah. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> if at any point, Janelle, you fill two ill to stay on uh please don't don't push yourself thank you for saying that luckily today is nothing but back-to-back -back virtual meetings so i'm going to try to figure it out with my camera off but we'll see what okay. happens understood you. you're welcome and then i'm just worried because i copied a lot of links is that link i put in for the survey actually taking folks to the survey yes okay Yeah, we just added to my uh my thousand tabs. So let me close that one out. All right, any other questions before we um quickly go through the survey findings? Doris, I'm gonna excuse myself and go do some research. Um Karen's here if you need any help with the Zoom and um just text me if you want me to pop back over. Awesome, we'll do. Thank you, Jordan. All right. Yeah, I appreciate any review you want to do, um, not to bogart the meeting or anything, but I wasn't getting invites or anything for the last couple of months, so I'm behind, so I'm playing catch up. Yeah, no worries. All right. Why do I, oh, there we go. I was like, why do I not remember how to actually do the slideshow? Um, so the the part of the charge the directives that we're focused on today is really evaluating um, and uh, treating children who have run away. Um, and one of those intervention um, potentials is temporary placement. Um, so just to sort of remind us of the directive. Um, the, the, the first question that was that was asked in the survey was whether or not um, respondents supported the task force developing recommendations regarding temporary placement for youth who have run from out of home care. Um, uh, overwhelmingly of the seven responses, uh, most indicated yes. 
Um, I think the 14.3% um, that indicated unsure is one respondent. Today, we're gonna focus on uh, two questions, uh, one that was um, in the survey and one that wasn't. Um, this first question um, I added because it was in the comments for one of the surveys uh, responses. Uh, what are the goals for temporary placements? Um, and I thought it was an important question to lift up uh, because I think as we, um, as was noted in the survey, and I think um, as I reflected on that particular comment, I think it is important for us to have some conversation around the overall goal or goals and purpose of the use of temporary placements. And I think that will help us to think through then what might be the policy elements um, uh, for implementing policies for temporary placements for youth who have run away from care. And then I also wanted to include the actual comments that uh, respondents included in the survey. Um, uh, there are two sets of narrative responses. One is uh, focus on the elements that should be included. Um, and then the other question is, um, you know, really trying to lift up and, and surface um, any elements that we have to, you know, maybe that, that this group may want to uh, specifically and explicitly exclude um, from uh, policy recommendations. Uh, so of those that was that were lifted up as elements to be included, um, as I mentioned earlier, there was um, uh, one who indicated, uh, I'm not sure, uh, but then some of the more concrete uh, potential elements were to look for possible kin temporary placement um, a caring, secure environment where staff can connect with youth and possibly um, are able to collect post-run data, um, place where youth can decompress before returning to programming, uh, supervision and care is provided, as well as um, uh, a recognition of the differences in youth circumstances and vulnerabilities. Uh, so the way that I read that is some acknowledgement of um, of those differences, uh, both in terms of the placement type and um, the intervention that might be included in that temporary placement. Uh, the training for staff should be should include motivational interview, crisis response, human trafficking, trauma response care, ultimately lots of training working with high high risk youth, um, and having built in support for other service providers similar to the shelters, which um, also allow for an extended stay not just 48 hours. Um, looking at risk factors, law enforcement input and advocacy input. Um, so information, the way that I read that is information um, that uh, could be gleaned from other groups that have an interest in and, and um, insights on what might be needed for youth. And then um, I think we would need to clearly identify and define why and what the intention of the of a temporary placement would be. And so this is the the comment that I specifically moved up into um, one of the uh, questions for discussion uh, today. And then in looking at the elements that need to be avoided, um, again, we have the I'm not sure response. Um, and then uh, we also have to not use a law enforcement facility as that temporary placement. Uh, we've had some prior conversation about uh, use of a law enforcement approach. Um, and I think this, uh, this comment maps to that as well. Um, an emergency shelter-like environment. Um, uh, I'd have to hear more from the group surrounding uh, current policies around this, if there are any to be avoided, I think with temporary placement hearing from what the youth wants is crucial. If we're not asking that, we're risking them simply running again. Uh, now we might not always be able to realistically accommodate what they what they are wanting, uh, but being transparent and explaining the why would go a long way. Um, assuming family is the best placement, sometimes that's the trigger and danger. Um, we should work to make sure that we don't allow rule, money, or anything um, intervene in providing the type of programming that we believe is necessary. So I think this one was really just um, a reminder to, um, you know, think uh, boldly in brainstorming um, and not limiting uh, that conversation to uh, the barriers that we think uh, might um, impede progress. I think that's the last slide. 
So I'm going to stop share and just see if anyone has any reflections or questions uh, before I, I give you some time to review the documents that Jordan put in the chat. Um, and then um, also start jotting down your thoughts in a note catcher that I created. Any clarifying questions, Kevin? Oh, just, just a comment. Um, I, I, I've heard the statistic that 70% of the time, the kids that, uh, you know, are in these types of facilities also have a criminal justice issue. And so the law, the law enforcement facility may be taken out of the hands of what we want. In other words, that's going to be a magistrate that makes that decision in, in many, many cases. And, uh, you know, my, my son's probation officer always made sure he went to juvenile detention whenever he ran from facility just for the run. So I'm just making that comment. Okay. Thank you. Janelle? <clears throat> I just wanted to follow up on um, what Kevin was saying that I know that there's a lot of talk about holding in law enforcement facilities versus like maybe a juvenile assessment center or things like that. And there are certain things that go into that decision um, of where we hold these kids, especially if they're like out of state, say they're on run from out of state and um, there's a lot of extra high risk factors there and things like that. And I do know, especially if human trafficking is involved, like the protocol is to hold them in detention so they don't run again. Doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily mean that they're in trouble, um, but it's to make sure that they can't run because there's a lot of places and Beth can talk on this too, but you know, there's a lot of places that they, they can just walk out of. And if they belong to say Texas or Arkansas or you know, California or something, it's our responsibility in Colorado to make sure that they're safe and okay. And since we can't stop them from running out of facilities, they might put them in a lockdown facility. And then the judge from the other state is saying, yes, hold them there until we send someone to come get them and bring them back. And so a lot of that different stuff goes into play too. So we can't necessarily make certain protocols that would be trumped by that. Do you see what I'm saying? I Yeah. I'm my brain yeah. is really foggy. Beth, can you please say something? <laughs> well, I do yeah, have a, I do have a hands, question. That's all. It's not a problem. I, 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 say that again, Kevin. I'm sorry. Oh, it's just something that would be taken out of the hands of whatever we come up with. You know, I mean, obviously, uh, criminal justice or the, you know, the juvenile justice system is going to probably trump whatever we do would be my thought. So it's not necessarily a problem. I, I do want to chime in, though, of that youth who run from in, out of state, that legally we can hold them and, you know, potentially, right, like place them in the gallium for, for transport at that point. But out-of-home out placement gets a bit more tricky in the sense that that's going to be then switched to DHS in regards to, like, Janelle's example, like, with human trafficking concerns, um just solely human trafficking concerns like we can advocate for like hey here's a safe place to be but we can't necessarily legally hold a youth in those facilities no. now i was going to ask a, a related question is it are for youth who run away who are not already uh justice involved would they be placed in a detention as the only locked option? No, we can't do okay. that. Okay. And Division of Youth Corrections and CYDC, they're mandated to keep those bed counts really low across the state. So even if they are juvenile justice involved, if they run from a placement, it does not mean that they will go to the go to DYS even for a short stay. Okay, thank you. That That is helpful. It... And right now, Doris, like there's a few places that they can go for like temporary holding, like they could go to Beth at the Jack, they could go to the 18th at the Jack, but like it might be temporary when they get picked up from on the run, but it's not necessarily a holding place. It's like a sitting place. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's and... like, a, a is, is it a like a youth like a, a safe place. Like we had a, we had a contract in, in Indiana that we, with multiple entities that were safe places for yeah, youth. Yeah, but they, have a, they just opened a new one in Adams County and kids, they actually have beds there and they can stay okay. there. 
in there. And then they also have like Shiloh, but those things are full quick and kids can run from there. It's not necessarily locked doors uh, out, but locked doors in, if that makes sense. And yeah. so it's just, and every, I don't know, Beth, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I feel like every case, at least that I come across, I feel like we have a different protocol depending on the nuances involving that child, where they are, what they're, most of them have like a DHS case a lot of times, or, you know, where that jurisdiction is and who we deal with it. And then every jurisdiction has some type of different protocol on how they do things. And so we have to go off of that just because they were picked up in Denver doesn't mean that they would go to Denver if they were out of Arapahoe or Douglas, they would be in the 18th and all of this. I do know the place in Adamsville takes someone from anywhere in the state and allow them to be held there for a safe place, but they're the only ones I know that do that. So usually when a kiddo is recovered or needs that placement, it, 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 I mean, we spend hours trying to figure out who and where and where they go. Am okay. I right? Here. Yeah, you know, I would agree with that, that it's definitely like every case is a bit different and having to be like it becomes very creative on the caseworkers part. And I know like with the kinship, you know, mm -hmm. that being a suggestion, obviously, like that would be the most ideal. But I've also seen where, you know, that those types of placements have been really harmful, where it's like we're placing a youth with their girlfriend. Yeah. And then there was a DV. Uh, domestic violence case involved and so there's like that's extremely harmful um I know that you know with Urban Peak and the source in Boulder that they will take youth um there's not a formal agreement with those but it's a um they can take a youth for 21 days and I know the source kind of in Urban Peak will do like all right 21 days here and then they'll transfer to the source uh, um, but also Sorry, but but they cannot serve um, children and youth in the child welfare system. That's not allowed. That provider, yeah. uh, that provider? homeless youth shelter cannot serve youth um, that are in the child welfare system. Yeah, like Urban Peak won't. I I actually just found that out. Beth, you and I had this epiphany a couple weeks ago, remember? And they wouldn't take them if they had um, DHS. They're like, well, if they're DHS, we can't take them here. But so they're just like homeless kids running the streets and no one's reporting them or getting DHS involved. Those are the kids going to places like Urban Peak. But the kids that have somebody that report for them and reach out and advocate for them, the DHS gets involved. Those are the kids that go to places like up in Boulder or all of these other places like Shiloh House and stuff like that. Correct? Yeah, I'm, Correct. I'm, 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 I'm a one. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, Dennis, I'm just aware of that there are certain, like, as a last resort where it's been temporary placement at Urban Peak by DHS. If, if that happens and, 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 and we find out about it, um, we will immediately intervene and make that county remove that child. Oh, good. No, okay. And, that, um, and, and that those, is... those facilities, um, their, federal, their federal funding does not allow for them to take kids from that are involved in the child welfare system. It specifically prohibits them. And what do you know why that is, Dennis? Uh, I used to run a runaway and homeless youth shelter, and it's because the, those 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 children and youth, um, ha, the the county. Well, in this case, the county has custody, so the county is responsible for the for the placement of the child or youth. Runaway and homeless youth shelters are for unaccompanied runaway and homeless youth. That I gotcha. Okay. Okay. I, I get, I mean, and that's a whole different soapbox conversation, I think, because yeah, it's, it's great that they're in charge of it, but they don't do anything about it a lot of times. And then these kids sit here and then we don't have places to put them. And then like Beth said, which I absolutely agree with, sometimes when there isn't like a third party placement, we resort to kinship and it's, or fictive kin. Um, and it, it turns into a crapshoot real quick and when you are play in those instances where you're placing with uh kin or fictive kin is the placement intended to be temporary i think it depends on the situation okay i mean so i was i was a fictive kinship placement um years ago for someone um and i will tell you right now when they handed me this baby 
um, from the hospital, it said, I said, okay, well, what does this look like? And they're like, well, would you be willing to like do this for like six months to maybe forever? And I was like, huh? So no, that, yeah. so that, I mean, that would be like a tr traditional placement, uh, a tr like a traditional kin placement for a kid who is coming into foster care. Other they're not being traditional about that situation, but no, yeah. no, no, but I'm trying, I'm trying to distinguish it from youth who run from care. No, no, I get it. I'm just saying like a lot of times that is kind of what's led with, you know, this could be temporary, this could be long-term. And in my experience in cases, like a lot of these foster parents or kinship placements. So when I come on to case manage, they might go to like an auntie or something like that. And they're reporting what was told to them. And they're a bit overwhelmed because they don't know how long it's going to be. But I mean, to play devil's advocate, DHS probably doesn't know how long it's going to be either because there's so many things that have to be opened up and talked about to see what's going on with the case, you know? So I just, nobody knows. It's fluid. Yeah, I just want I just want to make sure that we're narrowly talking about youth who run from care and options for temporary placement um so yeah so I, I just want to make make sure that we're 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 not talking about placements for all youth uh children or youth we're, we're really talking about options for kids who run from care uh Lynette and then Norma and then Kevin did you just come off mute or were you always off mute okay I just want to make sure that they, that you didn't come off mute. now you muted yourself and started talking Kevin, you're muted. <laughs> I'm pushing the button the wrong way is all. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm going to go back on mute until I have something worthwhile to say. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Lynette and then Norma. I was just going to say my experience in trying to find any placement for a youth that has run away is extremely difficult. Um, I don't know where you guys have been, but um, in your group, and I apologize for that. I think what we need is like specialized receiving homes or some type of a temporary shelter that we used to have available to us in Colorado. They were gotten rid of for good reasons. Uh, um, but at this point in time, these kids are staying in department lobbies, motel rooms. Whatever, yeah. And that's not working either. Looking for kin, most of the kid, these kids, they would have already been placed with kin if they were available. If they would have said yes to begin with, even with wraparound services. So I think we need to be realistic about who's actually going to be willing and able to take these kids and provide that, that intervention that they need in the meantime. Yeah. Thank you. Norma. Yeah. So, you know, I know I've heard a couple of people mention Shiloh, and I'm not sure if we're talking about the same program or not, or if we're, um, or if they have something in addition. But I mentioned this in my survey. We we have a partnership with Shiloh where there are f only four beds, um, but they provide the bed space. Savio provides the assessment pieces, um, and so, you know, I'm the person who wrote that we need to just be really intentional about you know coming up and defining what exactly are we looking for from these temporary beds, right? Um, so the, the program that I'm talking about that we have are for, you know, it, it a child could be, could have been on the run. Um, they could be sitting in detention and nobody sort of knows what to do with them, right? There's, there's, and, and again, there's only four beds. There's a very low, we have a very low AWOL rate. Um, again, it's only four beds. So we're talking about a very small N. Uh, the, uh, maximum length of stay is 21 days. Um, so what we do is we spend 21 days, like every day, seven days a week, really trying to assess and figure out what it, what are the needs of this child? Why haven't we been able to figure that out yet? Meaning, um, you know, do we have a parent who sort of dropped off, but now is back? Um, are there, you know, do we have a parent that this child cannot go home to for whatever reason? It can, can be a slew of things um, and some no fault to a parent, right? Like just whatever. It can be a number of things. So, you know, we're not looking at fault. We're looking to figure out what are the drivers to the child's behavior? What what is happening 
that that child is not able to be successful, whether it's in their home or in placement or whatever, and then sort of developing a plan and working from there. Um, honestly, more times than not, we've been able to get the child back home um, with some really intensive services, obviously. For the whole way this came about, this whole idea was not ours. Um, Douglas County came and said, we have a slew of, of, of kids who are um, delinquent children um, and we don't know what to do with them and we're failing miserably at putting them in placement um, and then you know they either languish there or they're running or whatever um, so we developed this very again very small small program um, but it took a year to get it off the ground because we had to sit and really figure out what the intention was what were we trying to really get at in order to to sort of develop a really a, you know, a program that was going to attack that driver per se. So, um, so I guess all I'm saying is when we function in, we just need a temporary placement for children, right? Um, and we're not intentional and purposeful about thinking about what do those really need to look like? How many of them do we really need, right? Are there different ones around the state that are going to address different issues. I don't know. All I'm saying is that when we just sort of throw out there the need for a temporary placement, we do nothing different, in my opinion, than, and it, I'm not trying to blame people, so please hear me. All I'm saying is we're going to do nothing different than what we do currently when a child is sitting at DHS, we have no place for that child to go, and we're just desperately looking for a place. So we're no longer paying attention to what that place is going to offer the child whether or not it's an appropriate placement for the child, right? Any of those things, we're no longer paying attention to that because we can't, right? Because yeah. the kid who's sleeping on the couch at DHS. Families First is pushing us to stop doing the, making those kinds of decisions, right? To really be purposeful about taking the time to be to assess the needs of a child and to make the right decision about where we're going to put that kid. So it may take us years to get to this temporary bed thing. In my opinion, it's not great, but it's not terrible if we end up with a really, really good product that will help us do something different than what we're currently doing um, when we're in crisis and kids are, you know, sitting in our on our couches or whatever. So that's just my little piece, two cents. Yeah, I think I think that's a great transition into um, the conversation around what would be the goals for temporary placement. Um, and so I'm I'm putting that question out to all of you. When you think about um, the use of temporary placements um, for youth who run from care, and what you were sort of imagining, those of you who completed the survey, when you said yes we should establish policies for uh, temporary placement. What were, was your vision around goals for the temporary placement? You want us to just talk or- Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you still have your hand up, Norma, so, um, and then I- Ben, well. do you have your hand up <laughs> and put it down? I did, yeah. Okay. Can no, I, I or should I wait? I with Norma, so go, go ahead, Norma. Are you sure? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess when I think about it, right? So if if the if the issue that we're trying to address is children who run from placement, then we need to sort of start there to figure out, okay, what are the things that we know for sure in terms of why children run from placement, right? So sometimes we know it's the setting itself isn't working for that child for whatever reason. Um, sometimes we know that you know, kids have been in so many placements that they've lost faith that anyone's going to find anything that's going to work for them. Um, you know, I don't know, the, the things are endless. So I guess, and maybe this is what you're asking for, Doris, but I guess we need to first identify, like Douglas County did when they came to us and said, we have a slew of delinquent children that we cannot place anywhere and we don't know what to do with them. And so now, as a provider, we need you to help us come up with you know, whatever the answer is to that. And then we took a leap of faith and we started this four bed program And the state now actually helps fund half of that, um, which is great, which is why I'm sort of saying, let's not get 
bogged down on money or things like that. Let's first figure out what it is that we're trying to do. And then we can fix, because we didn't know how we were going to fund this. Um, and then we ended up going to the state and they were like, absolutely, we, we need this. We're going to give you half of that. And, and, and just recently we got noticed that we are, have that money sort of in perpetuity now, which is great. <laughs> right. Um, and it's going to start small and then hopefully we can get bigger and bigger. So, um, I'm going to let you go, Beth, because I think you're going to do a better job than I. <laughs> money not in perpetuity if the high acuity bill passes, which um, I'm told it, it's going to pass. So let's all keep cross our fingers. Yeah, fair, Dennis. That's a fair statement. Beth? Yeah, I just think it's crucial. Like, this cannot simply be just a safe place to place the youth. Like, we have to be really intentional and built out with a program of you know, to Norma's point of like having an assessment, sitting down with the youth, getting to the why, um, and then building, it can't just be like, oh, we're putting them in a, in a cot, in an office building, which is how sometimes we currently operate. Um, and because what's the message that we're giving to the youth at that point? Um, and that's not the message we want to give. That's just, we're kind of currently handcuffed by the system. Um, but really being intentional about programming too, because that's the frustration that I see of like when we even like a youth getting out of system involvement and then just being thrown back in and it's like, what? And then it's like, okay, you're back out and then there's no programs in place. We don't have you currently registered for school. So being really intentional with, you know, this is what, while you're here, these are the programs and services that the youth is going to be provided and then really um, building up that trust and rapport to get to the why. Um, you know, currently we have a handful of youth and it will, uh, my office is starting to partner with Third Way on their high-risk youth that are running. I'm seeing it, they're running almost every other day. And, and then just going right back, that's not doing anything. And so how do we provide and partner more with community organizations to provide some more resources? And so with a youth like that, maybe being able to relocate to a temporary placement to really provide those more focused needs and then determine is, you know, the facility they were at, do we go back or is there another appropriate location for that youth? Yeah. So the, the, I, I know going from meeting to meeting, it's sometimes hard to hold like prior conversation, but when we, when we first started talking about, um, temporary placement, it was in the context of what happens when a youth is located. Um, and there was discussion around making sure that there was a place to, uh, that was safe, where they could go, where they could um, be assessed both for harm and also for the underlying reasons they ran away so that an intervention approach, like a plan, uh, could be put in place then to um, ensure that they are at the right placement and um, address any um, you know factors that you know could mitigate future runs. So um, I, I'm I'm submitting all that just you know sort of to to jog folks' memory of of what we talked about before um, when we were. Um, and it came out in the context of like these standardized response protocols um, for when a youth runs away. Also having, again, this, this safe place for them to go to do that kind of a deep assessment to determine whether taking them back to the place they ran from is, is the right approach. Um, and also then to assess for were they trafficked while they were away? Um, uh, what, what other things they might have experienced? Was there additional trauma that they experienced? while they were on the run and to get at what services and programming uh, might be appropriate again to mitigate future runs. Uh, Norma and then uh, Janelle, you had your hand up and then took it down. Yeah, so I, Beth, I think you're right on target. I think the other thing is that um, we just need to get creative about even the partnerships that can exist between the current providers that we have no one would have thought we were no longer in the residential business. So we didn't have residential beds when Douglas County came to me and said, we need your help with this. Right. So I said, I'm not going to open residential again for this. That doesn't make any sense. We have enough beds and enough providers right now. What we've got to figure out is how to best serve children using the beds that we have 
Um, and how do we build these little niches, right? So, so that we have enough of a menu of options for children and for caseworkers, especially when they have to place a child, right, that they can choose from. So hence how this sort of partnership with Shiloh came about. No one would have thought that two providers who, right, I mean, you know, Shiloh literally is just providing the bed space. And thankfully, they were willing to do that. Thankfully, they were not saying, well, we're a treatment provider too. Why can't we be the ones to do the assessment stuff, right? Like everybody sort of put their egos aside <laughs> and said, if this is what we need, how do we go about doing this as best as we possibly can? And knock on wood, it's been a super successful program for the last, you know, whatever, almost two years now. Um, and part of it is because of that, right? Because we can't, we all entered it in the sort of essence of partnership and saying, if this is what counties need and this is what children need, let's take what we both have and build the best thing possible that we can. Um, so I guess I, I just share that in saying, we also need to open ourselves to the possibilities of the providers that we have, what are they each really good at? And then how do we help providers join together to uh, you know, come up with programs that make sense for kids and families. Um, yeah, yeah. I put my hand down because it had kind of already been said what I was gonna say, so that's all. Okay, thank you, Janelle. So what I heard in terms of um, the some of the goals for temporary placement uh, to ensure that it's a safe place um, for the youth before returning to um, their prior placement uh, to assess the youth for um, any trauma or harm uh, while they were on the run, uh, to assess the underlying root causes for the run and identify the most appropriate um, longer term placement and services that the youth might need. Any other goals? I'm not a goal on this, but uh, I, I don't like this idea of a temporary placement. Why can't all of these same things be accomplished with the original provider? Responses from the group? Yeah. You know, Dennis, I don't I don't know that they can't is what I sort of will say. Um, I just I don't know that it's possible necessarily. Um, I think that, again, different providers have different strengths and sometimes it's just not the right fit and that should be okay. Um, especially if we can, um, build up the possibilities that caseworkers can choose from for children. Um, then I, uh, yeah, I just don't know that it's, I don't know that that can happen. Here's my concern. Well, sorry, I don't want to go in front of Lynette. Go, go ahead, Lynette. You finished, Dennis. That's fine. Uh, uh, right now, as currently what's going on in the state of Colorado, what's going to happen is if a kid goes to a temporary placement, that, that kid's bed at the other facility is going to immediately get filled. And then that kid's going to get stuck in that temporary placement, which none of us want. The other thing I would be worried about, too, is like running is contagious. So you put a bunch of runners into one facility. I, I'm worried about that, too. That's true too. Lynette and then uh, Norma and then Elizabeth. So my two cents worth is, and, and some of it goes along with Dennis, I think these temporary placements need to be low census. We don't need 50 kids in them. I also think if the facility will take the kid back and the kid is not refusing to go back, they go back to that placement and you work it out and you provide interventions. If, if you're able to. It's often though that when they run, the facility won't take them back anyway. So then we need a new assessment. What is gonna work? What is gonna be the right placement for them? And yeah, some kids may get stuck there because we have a lack of resources, but until we grow those resources, this is what we might have. And it's still better than DYS and it's still better than a child welfare lobby. Thank you, Lynette. Yeah, I, I wonder if there might be an opportunity to have policies and our protocols 
um, that are not limited to a temporary placement. So in the circumstance where um, returning the youth to the place from which they run, ran away uh, would make sense. And then I think that you would still want to have expectations around what that placement has to do once the youth returns. Um, and that, that, you know, could include, you know, doing an assessment, doing that root cause, um, you know, so, so I, I don't think that, that having a temporary placement option, um, necessarily has to mean that for all youth that run away, they would go to this temporary placement first before then going either back to the original placement or going back home or going, I don't think it has to be an either or. Elizabeth? Yeah, I was just going to say that um, to Dennis's point, running is contagious. You know, once kids find out if that they're going to go to this temporary spot for a few days to chill out before they go back or whatever, they're just going to start running just to just because they know they're going to somewhere else to take a break before they have to get place somebody somewhere else. You know, it's just like an adventure. <clears throat> Do you still have your hand up, Norma, or you have it up again? I have it up again. No worries. I just wanted to make sure. Um, Kevin? Yeah, I, I'm a full of real life examples, unfortunately. Uh, my real life example is my son was placed in Arizona and got eliminated from the facility he was in. Placed in a temporary facility. I said, he's a run risk. You realize that. Is this place secure? They said, oh, we don't know if it's secure or not. Of course, it wasn't. I drove down to pick him up to bring him back to Colorado. By the time he got there, he had run away um, and ended up in other states. So, you know, security is a big issue <laughs> for any temporary facility, I would think. And I'm not sure we uh, mentioned that enough. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do, sorry, can I, sorry, just, go ahead. I just say my piece real quick? Sorry. No, Norma. No, it's okay. <laughs> so um, I totally agree that the milieu needs to be very small, hence the four beds, right? Also, yes, it's running is contagious, right? So therefore, this, it never should be a place where kids are going to go to just get a time out. Every moment we have with a child and a family has to be used to some towards something, right? Towards learning more about them or towards, you know, whatever, B building a discharge plan, a transition plan, whatever. Every second we have with them has to be geared towards something. So it shouldn't just be that they're just going to land there if they run. It should be if they run, if there's a reason why they need this particular service, level of care, whatever we want to call it. Um, then they are also understanding that there's a purpose to this. It's not, you're not just sitting there. And the kids that are in these four beds, they all get it. We are constantly doing, every day we're doing assessments with them. If they're in public school, we're taking them to public school. We're spending time seeing how they respond to classroom settings. We're taking time, right? We're doing a number of things. We're taking them to their home and having them have dinner with their family. And we're sitting there and we're, we're looking to see what, what are we learning from what's happening right now that is going to help inform us what a good discharge plan for this child is going to be when the 21 days or the 14 days or whatever it is that they're spending with us is up. So um, it's not it's not just a place to like lay your head and just kind of chill while somebody figures out what to do with you. No, it's a it's an opportunity for children. And we talk to them about this It's an opportunity for them to really play a role in what's gonna happen next. And the only way they're gonna be able to do that is if they engage with us and are willing to sort of go through this process. Um, thankfully, more than not, kids are really willing to do that stuff. Um, at least they have been. Not all, by any means, it's never 100%. I wanna come back to the which youth we're totally going a little, we're not going off the rails. We're just having a slightly different conversation to really frame up like who we're talking about. 
um, and, and what, and what, you know, what would be the goals or purpose. Um, but when we think about um, identifying the youth for whom a temporary placement would be appropriate, do any of you have ideas around um, you know, what some of the criteria might be? Can you repeat that question, please? Yeah. Um, so, you know, we 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 had a conversation about, you know, this this notion that temporary placement would likely not be appropriate for all youth who run away. And in that then begs the question of, okay, so how do you then determine which youth should go to temporary placement versus going back to the placement from which they ran versus going back home? Um, what, what ideas do you have on the criteria to determine whether temporary placement should be a consideration or not? So for me, it would be a holistic approach. Were they making progress in that placement? Are they in the middle of working through their trauma, which is when you often see behaviors increase? You'd want to get them right back to that same placement to continue that work, as difficult as it is. If they're not making progress, if they're still doing chronic running away, then we may need to look at a temporary placement to to just separate, get an idea of what's really going on, do a good thorough assessment and determine what needs can we meet to help keep that youth safe. So I think it's on a variety of a continuum and, and a holistic assessment of that youth. And caseworkers and their supervisors often know if the kid was making progress or not in the program, or if they're just repeatedly telling you how much they hate it. You know, sometimes we forget to listen. Yeah. Just assume they're being bad because they're not used to having rules. And that's not always the case. Sometimes it's just a bad fit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Beth, and then I want to come back to Norma if you have your hand raised again. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously on like the basic level of we do have those youth who run from placement. And then they just lost their bed. So at the bare bones, right, that those youth would be applicable for this. Um, but then also in regards to, you know, that approach of like youth runs and we're going out and we're doing that assessment. If we have a youth who's disclosing to Lynette's point of like, you know, maybe there's some things going on at that location where the youth feels unsafe or something has occurred. And, and maybe it's one of those that, okay, that's going to prompt a whole other investigation. So we do need to remove that youth from that location. Or if it's just a breakdown in like what triggered that or, you know, with that service provider and giving that option in that multidisciplinary approach of like the youth coming back and meeting with the providers and like those providers hearing from the youth's perspective of like, this is what was triggering. This is why I'm having a hard time in this facility. Um, so that, you know, overcoming that issue with the youth and having their voice heard, I think would be really helpful. But if it's, if it's certainly a safety issue or something that's like allegations of abuse or anything like that, that would require this placement. Okay. Thank you. I would think too, for, um, if there, if the, the placement from which they ran did not specialize in working with youth who had been trafficked um it seems that why'd you smile Beth um <laughs> I would say that I think a majority of I've just seen this with programs that they'll say oh yeah we work with um human trafficking survivors and, or, and we're trained on human trafficking and then when I start having discussions about what that looks like it's I think right now, sometimes because it's so sensationalized, people will, you know, add that line of, you know, we were with human trafficking survivors, but when you start getting down to it, um, lacking the training to really say that you're actually doing that. I, I can. So would them, you want not, this not placement? One of our providers get, is good. Not, not, we do not have a provider in the state of Colorado that does this anymore. We used to have a couple that closed 
that used to specialize in working with youth who had been trafficked? Correct. Um, there was no um, payment source for the referrals to those facilities, so they were not financially viable. Gotcha. So would you want this temporary placement to have some actual expertise in, in working with trafficked youth? Absolutely. Absolutely. Or at least, or at least have, um, have accessibility to somebody that does, right? So again, it's not so much about the, in my opinion, at least about the placement itself, having to have, be good at all of these things, right? But if you can have accessibility to people that do, right? So, you know, do they have accessibility to a therapist or a community-based services group of people that does have this expertise, right? Um, could that be sufficient? You know, because we just can't be jack of all trades. Yeah. Um, right. And so. No, totally. Like, I think it's it's important, though, you know, obviously, like the council, the laboratory to combat human trafficking, like there does need to be built in. And this is we had this discussion like this is not just facility providers. This is law enforcement where, you know, one on one training needs to be built in across the board just to being able to to recognize the indicators but, you know, remember you're right of like making sure that there's other service providers that you can then refer out to. And I just, you know, with us taking over runaway reports, um, building a, a closer partnership with Third Way, I just got connected with them literally this week and they didn't know about the data MDT. And, and so we're looking at how do we partner with the, the youth that they have that are high risk for trafficking uh, with my team. And, and it just shows like, you know, there are these programs that exist, but are you aware of them? I Janelle and then Lynette. Sorry, I know oh, my sorry. hand. Can you remind me what, I'm sorry, I'm paying so much attention to what everybody's saying. I totally have forgotten what the original what the question was. was. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, is the uh, criteria for the use of the temporary placement. Okay, so in the waiting, a lot of people kind of touched on what I was going to touch on, but obviously like my big focus just because of what I do is the high risk in human trafficking and so many of those that run um, really, really have that high risk vulnerability. So, and I know that we've talked a little bit about Families First Act, which I think was great in theory, but we did not put things in place to actually prepare for it to going into effect. And so deep down, I'm trying not to hate it, but it's really hard. Um, with that said, I mean, that's why these placements that were specialized in these areas closed. Um, that's one of the big reasons that they reported that they closed. And so I just, I don't see how we get facilities to do these types of things Yes, I think that we should all be branching out and maybe that's something that we talk to the lab or to the council and I hold a chair on the governor's human trafficking council. Maybe they go train them um, or all these places and that's an outreach project that they have. But at the same time, I if they're not going to have a lot of space or we don't want a lot of kids there. Sorry, guys, I'm fumbling over my words. I don't feel good. No um, problem. <laughs> But having more therapeutic foster homes, and then I think that becomes into a larger issue is how are we treating these foster homes? None of them want to do it anymore. Um, and so I just think that that comes into a bigger conversation there. I think this is all great in practice, but actually putting it in and out into the world, I think it's just going to be a little bit harder than we think. Yeah, and I think that it it does come back to um, this as an option along a continuum. Um, so, you know, kind of really thinking about like what sort of narrow specific gap this temporary placement option would serve. And then also sort of thinking about, I think the larger um, set of protocols and policies around what happens when a youth runs away and making sure that there are options to, uh, to Lynette's point, like holistically um, assess the youth and also um, comprehensively meet their needs. Beth? I think the barrier with foster homes and the DHS members, please correct me if my impression's wrong, but 
the minute foster homes hear that this is a, a youth who runs regularly or is is high risk, they're they're saying no. You know, they're not accepting this youth. And so that's why we do have to look at this other location as opposed to just uh, relying on on current foster homes. Which also seems similar to um, a lot of the, the, you know, placements. Like the placements are also leery of um, taking on the risk of a youth who, particularly a risk, uh, a youth who is a chronic runaway. Um, but I think, I think we have to be, think, you know, again, coming back to like this being a part of a continuum, it's not intended to be a long-term placement. So the concerns about a youth, a youth's, I don't know why that's hard for me to say, a history of running um, and finding a long-term stable placement option for them, uh, you know, that that still would need to be solved for because this temporary placement would not be that. Janelle and then Dennis. Um, I, Beth actually said what I was trying to say, um, but it didn't work. Um, and that's that, you know, so many of these places won't take kids if they run, but this is exactly the gap that we need to fill is these kids that are chronic runners and are going in foster homes doing the same thing. The second an HRV tool is filled out and they're trying to place a youth who's high risk and they're like, oh, she has drug use. Oh, oh, she is, or he is, you know, maybe involved in human trafficking or this or that. They're like, oh, nope, we don't want that. They just hear danger and mm -hmm. they say, oh. And so that's what I was trying to kind of get at was how do we look at I don't want to use the word recruiting because that's kind of like a bad trigger word, but how do we look at establishing therapeutic foster homes for just this type of population, especially training them, especially having them do this for temporary so they're not, so they can kind of settle them. And then all of those other pieces can come in, in a holistic approach in a roundabout way, like kind of build that community army around them to get them stable enough, kind of what Norma was talking about. They do there, like, we're going to use this time to make sure that we're working forward to the next goal, almost like a step down, um, and only allow one youth in that home at a time. I just, I don't know if that's like a more systematic thing that we need to look at to building in Colorado, but it doesn't exist. And just from like layers of like poly victimization and things like that, that these youth go through, I just feel like that would be best. I know it's a pipe dream, but it is my dream. Thank you. Dennis? Uh, to, to Janelle's point, I, I think uh, we, we do have those things, but they serve different populations. To the extent that we've been successful getting providers to serve populations we want them to serve that they're not currently serve, serving, we the CDHS has to become the payer, payer. We contract with the provider. We pay them an exorbitant amount, but we pay. We guarantee the payment that even if there's no kid in the facility, we pay for the bed. But we tell the provider then we're going to determine who goes into the bed, not you. Um, but since we're resourcing them with everything they need to actually serve the population, we're generally pretty successful. So I, I think we could build something that could be successful in this realm if, 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 if it followed the model where CDH has contracted for it. And that would require, it would require the youth to come into care if they, not, they are not already. They would have to come into foster care. No, not necessarily. So our contracted beds that we have out at like Third Way and Southern Peaks, um, those are not just for child welfare kids. Those those beds are open to anybody. And CDHS is still the payer for those, all of those placements? Yes. All those, okay. Oh, nice. Okay. Okay. That's really helpful, Dennis. Thank you. Lynette? I was just going to say, for some of our older youth that are um, absconding from placement, leaving placements, my experience has been is that a lot of those youth have been in residential treatment for a very long time and have not been successful in family foster homes. <clears throat> they used to do much better in group homes, but those have been taken away. There are still a handful out there in the state. 
um, that are operating um, because they didn't have the attachment piece to a staff to group home. Um, I understand FSPA. I think it was a little short-sighted in some aspects. It's not serving all of our youth. Some of these youth used to do really well instead of being in residential treatment, but in independent living programs, some of these older ones before they turned 18, where they were living on their own with supervision, with services, with expectations. And we don't, we're not allowed to place them in those anymore until they turn 18. So it's, it's kind of like our, you know, if we're going to, if we're going to think outside the box, think outside all the boxes. Mm -hmm. Well, Lynette's right. We have a one, we have one program out at third way Bannock, not Bannock, sorry, Lincoln. Lincoln. And it operates like an independent living program because the, it's actually apartments and that, that facility does not have a big issue with runaways. Okay. I'm adding these as like just additional considerations um, in thinking about um, not just temporary placement, but all sort of that continuum of options uh, for youth who run, run away. Um, I'm going to do a screen share here and just reflect back what I captured. Can I ask one question before? No, we... Janelle. Please, please, please. Yes. Um, before Only because you said you said it very nicely and you don't feel well. So I feel sorry for you. Thank you. Thank you for your pity. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> I just have one question when, um, you know, I don't even know who was just talking about it, but the, you know, the single apartments there at um, Lincoln third way and things like that. And then we can't put them on the list for things until they're 18 or we can't place them in there. One thing that I've seen is that we can't even place them on some of these lists um, until they're 18. And then certain lists, we can do it like five months before they're 18. And these lists are well beyond five months or six months. Do we maybe want to look at recommendations to allow them to be on waiting lists long, you know, sooner rather than later to help open up some of those gaps? Just total random, but thoughts here. So you would be asking then to, as an additional consideration, establish a consist, consistent criteria for the waiting list for these independent living options? I mean, yeah, consistent, but also longer because some of them are not until 18. Some of them are only a few months before. So I don't necessarily want it to go. I don't want the pendulum to swing the wrong way. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Awesome. Any other comments, questions, concerns? Lynette, is your hand just still up? Okay. Yeah, sorry, I'll take it down. Yeah, no apologies needed. I mean, we've only been doing uh, mostly Zoom meetings for four years, but you know, we still can't get it together. And that really is the whole we, we can't get it together. It's like, why can't I get this together? Okay. All right, so here's what I what I added. Um, let me make this a little bit larger. Can you see my, my screen at top says goals for temporary placement? Yeah, it, it's, it's big enough, we can, I can read it. Okay, perfect. Um, so what I captured for goals for the temporary placement, provide a safe place for, for the youth after they have been located, um, and then a note about low census for these placements, um, assess the youth for any trauma and harm while on the run, assess the underlying root cause, um, causes for the run, and identify the most appropriate longer term placement um, and or services for the youth, ensure the facility is secure to prevent the youth from running. Um, and then there's a note that may need to consider this an option, but not necessarily the only response for all youth who run away. 
um, and then concerns about putting a group of youth with history of running away together. Um, uh, these, these, well, hold on a second. Uh, yeah. These are not these are not um, adjudicated youth. You, you can't just lock them into a facility. Like, OK, uh, so I don't not agree with the secure facility because you, you how are you going to do that? These are not adjudicated youth. OK, so we're going to strike this one. I don't see how, like, how are you, how, under what authority can you lock somebody into a facility when, they have, when they're not committed? So we're going to strike this one? Well, I I, 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 that, that's just my opinion, but I don't know what the rest of the group feels. I, I think that for me, the language should be staff secure. There's enough staff to help secure the facility. They can still run away. Does that, is that better, Dennis? If yeah. you say staff secure. That, that, that uh, relieves uh, some of my anxiety for sure. Okay. Others? Oh, God bless you, Dennis. <laughs> so, I think that, I, I, I mean, I, I think that the staff secure piece, I think, is sort of like this false, I don't know, like the reality is, Lynette, you're right, kids can still run. I mean, and, and I don't know that like locking them up is best either right i think really in, in at least in our experience the 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 biggest defense around a child running is people talking to them people you know being aware that the child is at risk to run and therefore putting an intervention in that addresses that whether it be you know you're going to be attached to this human being this adult for the next 24 hours and we're going to revisit it every 24 hours right or let's talk about like why you want to run blah 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 like all of that stuff in in my experience those are the things that are helpful in helping children not run is it a hundred percent no kids kids can run and yeah. they will right i think maybe doris also noting right like keeping this at a very small size because uh, I, I do agree with Dennis like it, sh it shouldn't be a secured facility and is that in addition to what's here the low census oh I'm sorry I didn't see that yeah I would just yeah in, in regards to the um, I think it, keeping it secure the staff secure I think keeping it at a small number so that there is that attention to detail per each youth I agree with that. And if we make it too aggressive when clearly they're already undergoing something, especially when it's a first time and we don't have any evidence that this youth is going to harm themselves or harm other people or anything like that, I just think that we're ruining rapport by jumping right into that. And then they're never going to trust us or anyone else on their team. And it just puts us in a really bad position. So does the, the the language that's here in number four, is that, are we comfortable with this, that, that we have the staff secure, ensure the facility is staff secure to mitigate the risk of youth from running um, and ensure low staff uh, to youth ratios? Beth, I think I saw your, your thumb up. Yeah. All right, and then moving to the criteria for youth, um, for use of the temporary placement, the youth was not making progress. And I turned some of these into like, like criteria kinds of statements. Um, the youth was not making progress in prior placement. Uh, running away behavior is chronic. Youth's needs were not being met at prior placement, which is similar to one I paused because it was like, did I just say that? Um, no other placement options for the youth. Um, in, the, in parentheses, uh, lost bed in prior placement. Youth disclosed safety concerns at prior placement. Uh, use MBT approach to understand why youth ran and youth who have been trafficked. Number six is written a little bit wonky, but any other considerations for criteria? All right, and then looking at some additional considerations, uh, need to create a continuum of therapeutic placements and other long-term placement options for youth with a history of running away. CDHS establish uh, or could establish a network of providers to serve runaway youth. 
Uh, some older youth with a history of running away have had had success with independent living programs that allow them to live inter. I put interdependently versus independently um, because they are actually interdependent um, and then establish consistent criteria for waiting lists for independent living options, um, including longer runaway, runway, run, oh, runway for waiting lists. So a longer um, time horizon for uh, the waiting lists. Anything missing? Uh, from any of these sections, the goals, the criteria, or additional considerations? Anna? So nice to hear your voice. I'm sorry. I was, I was letting everyone else talk. They covered everything. Um, I was just thinking in additional considerations to maybe, and not. I know we've talked in, on a number of different aspects today, so not necessarily something to discuss it, like today, but considering a um, length of time this temporary placement would be. Um, I think historically I have seen these temporary placements end up being extensively longer term than intended just because of our lack of placement options. Um, and so just something to I don't know, think through or think if we want to look at a time frame or a limit or, a, you know, something. Thank you. Is this, did I reflect this accurately in this last bullet? I struggle with the word cap, um, but just kind of like, a, a, I don't know, some kind of parameters, some kind of um, expectation to work within. Um, I mean, we have caps on all sorts of things of like, you know, a place, you know, QRTP can only be 30 days or whatever it is now, right? And we, we always have the caps and it always creates issues, but a, an examination of don't let it languish. I'm like, I knew I was spelling it wrong. I couldn't figure out what I was doing wrong. Lynette? I was going to say the caps, but there has to be a way to get an extension. I think the county should have to prove the efforts they've made to get them to a different level of care, different things like that, so that there is some oversight and nobody's just letting a kid languish there because we know that does happen unintentionally usually, but it happens if there's no oversight. Um, I also think back on the independent living programs um, that we need to specify that that can be used for youth under 18. Uh, Doris, on the second to last bullet, we already have a mechanism um, for that. Uh, the county would, would submit an appeal. For this one, um, the, the expectations parameters? This one here uh, or this one? Yeah, right. The county, the county department would have to submit an appeal to the Department of Human Services if the length of stay was going to go go past, say, twenty one days, and then the department would would make a determination of whether or not the the appeal was granted, based on all the things Lynette was saying. And they submit the the appeal to CDHS. Correct. Yeah, we have an appeals panel. So then will we, are you thinking, Dennis, that we don't have to include this specific bullet or maybe a note that this could be, the current appeals process could be used for this right, temporary the placement? Appeals policy. So like, because I understand what everybody's saying about like, you, yeah, you want to keep it to 21 days or less, but there are going to be some cases where a kid may, or a youth may have to be there past that. In that case, okay. the county would have to submit an appeal to the department. Okay. And so we would just like restate that. Does this does this make sense here? This highlighted section currently county has to submit an appeal to CDHS, which could be used for these placements. Yeah, I think that's fine. You and, were gonna that, that, that suggest by, by itself that establishes the oversight that CDHS would have oversight of the practice, um, because we're we're the ones that would be making the determination of whether or not the, the child or youth could stay past twenty one days. Gotcha. Okay. The facility would also have to be licensed, so CDHS would have purview over the provider as well. Okay, and then that that actually then I think also then connects it back to this one, this second bullet about CDHS establishing the network of providers to serve this these use. So I think the network could include. 
these uh, temporary placements, but also the other kind of step down placements uh, that that this group talked about uh, this morning. Yeah, and in the, that bullet, I would say the CDHS could establish and fund a network of providers. We always like it when you want to add the funding part. <laughs> well, we have, we, if, if, if we don't fund these kind of programs correctly, um, they won't survive. Yep. So like like what Norma's doing, like the, you can't do that. I mean, it, with, without state funding, it wouldn't, it, it's not viable. Yep. Which I think speaks to the earlier point that you had, um, you know, some of these similar kinds of placements in existence before and they're, they've now all gone by the wayside. Any other additional considerations? Any additional additional considerations? Let me maximize my box here. All right. I don't know what time Trace said we were gonna go back. Um, I really wanna since we I think we have a couple minutes. Um, nine forty five, I think, Doris. If I remember. Okay, so we have a couple minutes. Um, so with the few minutes that we have, thank you, Norma. I think it was you, Norma. Is that who spoke? Who spoke? Okay. Um. I want to want to just focus on this first question because we've talked about some of this, but um, any other considerations for recommendations to include in the policy um, for temporary placements? I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? Yeah, it's this question right here. What would some of the elements to include in a policy? Want me to make this bigger for you, Norma? How about I move the question down here? Okay, that's that's not nice, Doris, but <laughs> I do need it bigger. I'm sorry, I keep on going off screen because like I don't want you guys to see my big old forehead. As I'm trying, trying to lean in to see it. <laughs> yeah, let me make this larger. No, there was there there really wasn't. Girl, I got fifty year old eyes. I can't see it when it's teeny tiny either. <laughs> Is that better? So, so I think one of them is that we want a small milieu. So uh, we would I would say we want to have uh, uh, if it's four or five or youth or less in the facility. I also think we need um, regional ones. Yeah, I definitely regional ones. Yeah. And uh, we talked about um, uh, that they would be 21 days or less. Uh, we talked about that they would have to be funded by, by CDHS. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Um, and then I think like as far as like how you're gonna build these out and what these programs need to look like, I don't know that this committee has to figure out how to do that. I I think that could be Agreed. through the rule writing process. Agreed. I also think that they should have um contracts with service providers, including at least one who has um training in, in traffic youth. That was something I heard earlier that I thought was a really great idea. But I don't think it's realistic to have them have those therapists on staff. I think that would be problematic in getting these placements to open. Yeah. I do think like the continuation of care. So whatever services were being provided in the facility that they were at, there can't be this break in in services um, once at the, the facility. Beth, can you Especially if those services were working. Yeah, I was just gonna say, can you speak to that a little bit more? Meaning, can just like, can you give me an example, please? Uh, like the the continuation of care piece. 
Yeah, so I, I guess I'm just trying to, when you say there's no disruption of services, right? Meaning, so if a child ends up in one of these beds, um, what do you mean by no disruption in the continuation of services that the other provider was offering? Do you know what I mean? Like, so if we're going to use these beds to really assess what's happening, then there probably is going to be some level of disruption in the service that the child was receiving in the, the facility and probably okay. Clinically, I'm thinking probably okay. Cause it means everyone is saying sort of for lack of better words, we're going to stop the ship, right? Cause something's not working right. And we're going to reassess, right? Yeah. I guess where, where I'm coming from is I've seen on several cases where, right. Maybe youth is receiving substance use treatment and then they've run, they've lost their spot. And now it's like, we've got to go through more assessments or, and now they're back in a waiting list to receive that, those, those services. So that that's more of the, right. Like if we, we have, and, and then similar with like, all right, you know, youth was seeing a therapist um, and then, you know, they run not being able to, and they're wanting to see a therapist. Like that's crucial, right? When a youth is in both of those capacities, if a youth is saying, I want substance use treatment, I want a therapist, like telling them, great, uh, it'll be 30, maybe 60 days um, is super harmful. I see what you're saying. Okay. Thanks for, for that. I appreciate yeah. it. Lynette. I was just going to say that the, the, the lack of substance abuse treatment providers for adolescents, <clears throat> particularly on the Western slope is absolutely unbelievable. You will not find one that can just pick up when a kid you, leaves a facility that was providing that. Um, but continuation, I think it should be minimal disruption of services, you know, efforts made to minimize any disruption of services because it it's out of our control. I yeah. like that. What's yeah, out I, I had already yeah, been that, in the conversation great. and change no to minimize. Thanks. Yeah, no worries. And then and then also added the specific examples um that Beth shared so that there's a little bit more context there. All right, it looks like we are supposed to go back. Um, I want to uh, just make sure that if anybody has anything like top of mind that they want to add here, that we have a chance to do that. Um, otherwise, I think we're going to go back to the main room. Okay, wait, how do we do that? I'm sorry. <laughs> I feel like oh, I, I got to put the, uh, <laughs> the, the link. Karen, Thanks. can you drop the link back into the main room? Do you have that handy? I actually don't let me grab it from Jordan really quick, okay? Oh wait, I'm I can go. I just I can just go in my in my my me my calendar. Yeah, I didn't have that. I apologize. Yeah, no problem. Hold on one second. All right, putting it in the chat now. Oh, you are? Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, see you all in just a little bit. Thank you so much for a really good discussion. I'm going to stay on just to make sure everybody can get in. <laughs>